طيب It's funny I didn't think about this until just now but I bet people are probably thinking oh we're going to preach a trinity sermon right we're starting in 1 John chapter 5 nope that wasn't the plan at all I was focused on uh, Something completely different, but with the things that are going on right now, it seems like it would be fitting to preach a, a Trinity sermon, but we're not doing that tonight. In fact, the subject matter that I want to cover this evening, the title of my sermon is Assurance of Salvation. Assurance of our salvation. I preached, uh, I don't know if it was maybe one week ago, two weeks ago, on loving the brethren, and I already knew that... Uh, some of the, the statements that I made was probably going to get some people upset and, and start calling me, you know, basically lumping me in with, with heretics and Paul Wash and all those other nonsense. nonsense. And I, don't, I hope no one here was, is mixed up about that at all or by anything that I said. But I am all about clarity and I am all about being um, consistent with God's word but giving um, just all of my, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Allegiance to the word of God and trying not to allow any doctrine, any teaching to, you know, to get so extreme that you start contradicting what God's word says. That, that we get so zealous fighting against a, uh, a, a false doctrine that we end up getting a little bit too imbalanced with what the Word of God actually says. So what I, what I want to try to do is just let's look at Scripture and, and take it for what it says. And don't worry, I'm not going to teach anything weird tonight, okay? And if, you, and if you disagree with some point I make, I, I hope you can at least see and understand where I'm coming from. And the first part of this, I'm going to make abundantly clear because there has been a lot of confusion by many churches, many pastors, many people out there just about salvation in general anyways. You know, the crowd that tells you you have to repent of your sins in order to be saved. Well, which sins do I need to repent of? Well, wait a minute, I sinned today. Does that mean I'm not saved? And all the, the, the lack of clarity and all the confusion that's out there because of the works-based salvation crowd. And then you have the Calvinists or the people that say, well, if you're really saved, you're going to do this work and this work and this work. Look, I'm against all of that. I'm against all of that. And I always have been. Ever since I pastored this church, you can find sermons preaching against that. And I'm going to be clear about that tonight too. Okay? Just so we know, first and foremost, where we stand, because the verses I'm going to be dealing with are actually other forms of assurances of our salvation where people might get confused or mixed up on, but I want to you know, cover them with clarity. So the very first thing, and the only thing, when we go out soul winning, when we talk to people, it's all about faith. I preach an entire sermon about doubting your salvation. And if, if anyone doubts their salvation, do you know how you know that you're saved? It's, do you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Is all of your faith in Him? That is the number one. That is where you need to start. That's where you go to if you want to know that you're saved. Now, as we'll see a little bit later, God has given us certain things like a Holy Spirit, He's made some statements that it's going to be impossible for a saved person to do. So we're going to look at other aspects of what it means to be born again and some other things that a saved person can or will have. They won't always have it. And we have to be very careful. I'm going to be very clear. And we need to be very paying attention to every word that's spoken. I'm going to be very careful with my words because making a mistake or slipping up in the way that I use my words can, can cause a lot of damage and make things unclear. But when we start out, we say, how does someone know they say, and this is why I'm going to start out in 1 John chapter 5, because this is a passage that we do use out soul winning regularly. 
on a regular basis. It breaks things down and makes things very clear. For one, it tells us in verse 13, you know, these things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. We use that to show people, say, hey, you could know, you could know 100% for sure that you're saved. You have eternal life. Eternal means forever. It's never going to end. You can know that you have that. Why? Because you believe. See, I've written these, you already believe. So you know it. You can know for sure you have eternal life. Because it's not based on works. It's not based on anything else. There's no, there's no, there should be no doubt about it. There should be nothing that's causing you to doubt whether or not it's just as simple as, well, did I believe? It's my faith in Christ. It's not, did I believe enough? It's not, did I do enough works afterwards? It's not, did I go to church enough? That, that is not how a person knows that they're saved. It's, did I believe? A lot of what we're going to be covering tonight also, just so you know, is not necessarily geared for someone who's just an extreme doubt of their salvation. We receive assurances of our salvation regardless of ever even having to doubt it, right? So the, if anyone had doubts about it, you know what I'm going to do, or how I would instruct that person or count that person is exactly what I just said. Do you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? If someone doesn't remember calling on the name of the Lord, if they don't remember a certain time when that happened, but they know that today their faith is 100% in Jesus Christ and that they, believe, they know it's eternal life, they know they can't lose it, they, know, you know, they understand salvation, then you're saved. That's the bottom line. You shouldn't have to go and beat yourself up over this detail or that detail on, on what you remember what you don't. If this is what you believe today, you, you know that you're saved because, you could know that you're saved because of that. That's the bottom line. Now look, does that mean I don't teach that you need to call on the name of the Lord to be saved? Of course not. Of course I teach that. That's, that's something that we ought to do. It's something that I did when I got saved. I prayed unto Jesus. But, but if someone doesn't remember doing that, maybe they were young or maybe, you know, maybe they did it in their heart and they don't realize that they were calling on God, you know, whatever. If they believe today that their faith is 100% in Christ and they're not trusting their works, they know they can't lose it and it's all in what he did, then they're saved. That's the bottom line. And that's where you're going to derive your assurance of salvation. Verse number um, 10 here in 1 John chapter 5, you know, we use this frequently also to just to demonstrate that it's eternal life. The people that, that you have to believe that. That, that, it's, that it, it is one of those things that's required. That's why we, t in, we cover what's known as you know, eternal security or once saved, always saved, because it's inherent to salvation. It's, it is one of those inherent doctrines that you have to believe in order to even be saved. And 1 John chapter 5 covers this explicitly in what you have to believe if, in order to not be calling God a liar. What we believe determines whether or not we're saved. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son hath not, um, hath not seen God, but the wrath of God abideth on there's, there's so many verses. John chapter 3 covers it. So many places that, that say that you know, what you believe, it's your belief. And what I love about 1 John chapter 5 is it, is it kind of spells out a little bit of that belief. And that if you don't believe these things, you're calling God a liar. And if you're, if, if you're making God out to be a liar... When it comes to salvation, you don't believe right. You don't believe what you need to believe to be saved. Look at verse number 10. The Bible says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. And we're going to be getting to that later too, not from this verse necessarily, but right there it says, He that believeth on the Son of God, who's, who is that? Jesus Christ, hath the witness in himself. Who's the witness? The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. That's the witness. If you believe, you have the witness in yourself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life and this life is in his son. Three points. I, I show this so many times out soul winning. God hath given to us. It's a gift. It's free. You don't earn it. It's not merited. It's not your own works. It's given. It's eternal life. Eternal means forever and that this life is in his son. It's not through Allah. It's not through Buddha. It's not through Muhammad. It is through Jesus Christ. That's salvation. Those are three very simple things, very simple concepts. But if you don't believe any one of those things, you're making God a liar. 
And the fact that it's eternal is the one we usually like to focus on because people don't have much of a problem believing it's only through Christ, at least not in the United States of America, not where people are growing up with a, with a Christian type of a culture where they're not worried about some other religion. It's just Christianity, and we're trying to get uh, you know, so-called Christians saved in, in believing on Jesus Christ. So they don't have a problem with that. And they usually don't have a problem saying that it's a gift because they've just heard that over and over again even though it's not truly what they believe because they still believe in, in some way, shape, or form their merits have a, a way to do with it. And when we go in depth and describe eternal life, that helps to expose that they're not believing that it's a gift because they think if they commit some sin, they break the law, they'll lose it. It's not eternal anymore. Um, anyway, you, you guys know this. I don't want to keep on going on about that. Verse number 13, these things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. You may believe on the name of the Son of God. How do we know we're saved? T uh, Titus 1, verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. How do we know that we're saved? Because God can't lie. Because God, when God makes a promise, he holds true to that promise no matter what. We have a God that never, ever, ever lies or goes back on his word. So if God said something, if it's written in scripture, then it's true. And, and you can entrust your entire existence, your life, your soul to God's word and God's promises. So if someone asked, how can I know for sure I'm saved? That's going to be the answer that I give them. Okay, just for clarity's sake. That is the answer that you need. And if you ever doubt or question your salvation, that is the answer that you go to. That is... And we could, I could go on all night just basically proving how salvation is so simple and it's only through faith and has nothing to do with your evil deeds, repenting of your, your, your sins or anything like that. But that's not the scope of the sermon tonight. How do we gauge whether someone else is saved? Well, basically along the same lines. Salvation is based on your faith. It's based on what you believe. So what comes out of their mouth is how we're going to judge someone else. In Matthew 12, verse 33, turn if you would to, um, go stay in 1 John, go back to chapter 3 in 1 John. I'll read for you from Matthew 12, verse number 33. The Bible says, either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. And by the way, this is talking about a tree, some, someone that's already producing and bringing forth other things. That's not your average, that's not just a fruit, that's a tree, right? So don't want to get into all that though. O generation of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Jesus is talking to Pharisees. He's talking to people here that didn't believe. He's saying, he's calling them a generation of vipers. And after he just gets done saying, you know, hey, the tree's either good or it's bad. And if a tree's good, the fruit's going to be good. If the tree's bad, the fruit's going to be bad. You can't have a tree that brings for, a bad tree that brings forth good fruit. And you can't have a, 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 a good tree bringing forth bad fruit. They don't, it doesn't work that way. So he's relating that to these generation of vipers, these, these, these false prophets, that he says, you're evil. How can you possibly speak good things? Basically saying they can't speak good things. Why? Because they're an evil tree. They have bad fruit. And then he says, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment, for by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. How do we know whether someone else is saved? We go by their words. We go by the abundance of the words that comes out of their mouth because it reflects what's in their heart. Now, can people lie? Yes. Are we going to know for sure whether somebody else is saved? Ever? No. Not one, you can never know 100% for sure because you can never know what's in that person's heart. But the way that we judge other people is based on their words. We just ask. And you know what? That should be good enough. Because at the end of the day, what, what's the worst that's going to happen? If someone lies to you about their salvation, they're only hurting themselves. It doesn't do you any harm. 
they're hurting themselves by lying to you. And let's say someone says something that sounds kind of funny. Maybe someone says, well, you got to repent of your sins to be saved. But they're actually saved. They just don't understand what they're even really saying. They're repeating what they've heard over and over again. I, I hear this quite a bit, actually. And I hear this half the time the people are saved and they just repeat what they hear because they just hear it in church. But when you actually dig in and question them about it, they're like, oh, no, it's not, you know, like, I can't lose my salvation and it's not, you know, it's not because of anything I did and it's a free gift and they just completely understand it. They're just using bad terminology. But what's the harm of, of thinking that, well, maybe this person isn't saved because they're using bad terminology. There's no harm in that, especially since what you should be doing at that point is trying to clarify. Do they really believe this? And then give a little explanation and then you're going to help that person and then you could come to the conclusion after a little bit more discovery. Pretty simple, right? Pretty straightforward. That's how we gauge whether someone else is saved. That's how we gauge whether we're saved. What is it that we believe? What is it that you believe? We ask people that come in and visit this church, hey, what do you believe it takes to be saved? We do that at the door. Hey, what do you think you have to do to go to heaven? That's how we gauge. Are they saved or not already? So because if they're already saved, what's the point of giving them the gospel again? They're already saved. And if they're not saved, let's give them the gospel. Very simple. Now, with all of this said, I wanted to make sure I spend enough time because this is not the bulk of the sermon, but I want to make sure it, it, it's abundantly clear. Okay, this, this, is, this is the clarity that I want to make sure we have here because we're going to look at a few verses that some people will twist out of context. They'll, they'll, they'll twist it to say something else. The, you know, work salvationists will, will try to use different things to, to make it sound like you need to have, if you don't have works, you're not saved. I do not believe that. I do not teach that. I have never taught that. I didn't teach that a week or two ago when I taught on loving the brethren. That's not what I said. We're going to cover though some of these verses and we're going to, we need to understand that there's, first of all, there's no contradictions in God's word at all. And it's completely true. And everything in the Bible should be taught and it should be taught because it's in the Bible. So if there's something in the Bible that, and, and here's, so here's a good example of, of what my concern is just in general with any doctrine. When you fight really, really hard a certain direction, you could end up getting into an area that you didn't intend to go to because you fought so hard and kind of pushed yourself a little bit in balance. A perfect example of this is uh, the Trinity. The biggest opposition to the Trinity in general has been by Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, right? People who want to say that Jesus Christ is not God, that they deny the deity of Jesus Christ, that he's not a power of the Godhead, he's not God, you know, he's just a man. So what do we do? Well, we fight against that. We fight against that. We fight against that. We fight against that. And that's what we're focused on so much. But you don't want to get to this point to where you get into this modalism heresy of just basically saying, well, you know, there isn't a trinity anymore. It's just all one God. That we do believe there's one God. Yes. Yeah, so let me, let me be, again, be very careful with the words that I choose in these concepts. There is one God. It is all one God. But there are three distinct persons within the Godhead. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Yes, there are three, and yes, there are one. So we want to be careful that we don't get off the deep end when it gets into any concept, and especially even this, when it comes to fighting against the, the, the Paul Washers and the John MacArthur's that are, that are this, these big repent of your sins guys and, and the, this works-based uh, evidence of salvation. I'm against that too. I don't, I don't believe that you could look at someone's works just to tell if they're saved because it can't tell you if they're saved. Now, the book of 1 John teaches many things, not just one thing, even though there are overarching themes within the book. There are many statements found within the book of 1 John that can even stand alone and, and you can look at as a verse and, and look to. I mean, most of it has to do with loving and loving your brethren and loving God 
and, and keeping his commandments, you know, things like that. But there's five chapters. It's, it's, it's not a long book, but there's a lot of stuff packed into these five chapters. Now, I think First John does an excellent job of, of putting the difference between the new man versus the old man. You know, the Bible says in, in 1 John 3, it says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. And that could be a very difficult passage for many people. What in the context here, what it's describing is the new man, the new creature that's born does not commit sin. And it goes back and forth between, the, you know, an old a sin nature and a, and, a, and a saved nature, the, the old man and the new man, and teaches this stuff and how we ought to walk in the new man and love the brethren. And I've taught this for years, and that is what I believe, and that is why I teach on this. It's definitely true, and it is an emphasis in the book. However, that does not mean that nothing else is taught in the book regarding salvation, that there's no other concept or nothing else that you can see in there other than that. And the verse that people have a problem with is verse 14, with what I teach on this, on verse number 14 in 1 John chapter 3, the Bible says, We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Now, I'll tell you what I believe about this verse because I believe what this verse says literally. And I understand the context. I understand what's going on before this. Like I said, just a few verses earlier in verse number nine is where it says, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. And context is very important because in chapter one, it says, look, if we say that we don't have any sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Obviously, it's describing in chapter three a little bit more of a complicated uh, subject. Right? Because he, for, he starts off just saying, look, for clarity's sake, if you say that you don't have any sin, you're deceiving yourself. The truth's not in you. Of course you sin. But now he gets into here saying, look, if you're born of God, you don't commit sin. But he clarifies that even within the same sentence. Why? Because his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Talking about the creature that is born of God, that is born of God's seed, that, that has that life inside of you. Of course. That this is the context, but when we see in verse number 14, and again, I think this still matches along with this. First, the book of 1 John is, is authored, obviously by God, but, but the apostle John is who penned this down. And you'll notice when you read scripture that even though God is the ultimate author of every book, there are writing styles and words that are used more frequently, especially by people who have more books of the Bible, like the Apostle Paul, you can see certain things that he says or, and, and phrases that he might use. There's a little bit of a personality to the letters, to the epistles or whatever that they have in the Bible. John is the same way. John is the one who penned down the book of John, the gospel according to, to John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. One of my favorite verses, out soul winning, I almost never skip this verse, is John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on, on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from what? From death unto life. Now, there are words that are used in the Bible like saved that doesn't always have to refer to a person's soul being saved. We know this, okay? That could be proven. I've proven it before. You know, salvation, saved. You know, he that endureth unto the end shall be saved. That's not talking about your, your soul being saved. That's talking about your flesh being saved, okay? There's other words that are very similar, and context always matters. But passing from death unto life, I can't think of a context where that's not talking about your salvation. You've passed from death unto life. I mean, I suppose maybe it's possible in a physical sense. I don't know. I mean, to me, it's kind of a stretch because this phrase isn't used very often. I think that might be the only two times that this phrase is even used in the Bible, passing from death unto life. John 5, 24 is very clearly about salvation. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 14, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. Now, I believe that verse to be true. 
I believe that that's talking about a saved person. He says, we know, we know what? We pass from death unto life because we love the brethren. Now, also in this chapter, you'll find out that it's not even possible in the context of what of the type of love this is talking about for an unbeliever to even have that love. And I have that later in my notes, but I want to I cover that right now. 1 John chapter 4. Turn, if you would, to chapter 4. Verse number 7. The Bible says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. So, verse number 7, it says, Everyone that loveth is born of God. Everyone that loveth. You could say, well, I know a lot of un unbelievers. I know a lot of people that, that don't believe, but they love. Not according to what the Bible's saying here. And again, it's the definition of love, right? What is, what is whole, all First John basically talking about with their love? It's a selfless love. It's this dying for, you know, there, there's, there's a particular love that the Bible's talking about here that it's impossible for an unbeliever to have. I would put it to you this way. In the book of Proverbs, what does the Bible say? In Proverbs 13, 24, it says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Doesn't that teach that if someone doesn't use the rod and discipline on their child that they hate them? Isn't that what it says? I mean, it's pretty clear, right? Pretty straightforward. I know, so I know people that, that, that don't spank their kids, but they love them. They take them out to eat. They do nice things for them. They, they, they do other things. You know, they, they try to raise them right. Well, okay, but according to the Bible, that's not true. It says they hate them. And this is what I'm referring to when I'm talking about just being able to accept the Bible for what it says. It is important to know the context and the meaning that goes along with this, ultimately, how we're supposed to be, you know, how we use this, I don't just go and use 1 John 3.14 to try to tell someone at the door, well, see, this is how you can know that you're saved when you start loving the brethren. But there is an, an assurance that you get when you are saved and when you do love the brethren, when you do have this love that, that is capable of those that believe God, those that are born of God that have this love, you know what? That's comforting. When you, are, when you exhibit that love, when you have that love in your heart for other people, for other brethren, that can provide comfort and assurance for yourself. That's not what, you're, that's not what I'm going to look for to just make sure I'm saved. But I described this in the sermon I preached on before, and it's, it's basically a similar type of thing. When we go out soul winning and we run into somebody that's already saved, you find out they're saved, don't you have that feeling of love for that person that as soon as you find out they're saved, it's just like, wow, it's, it's like your instant friends. And you notice that. Now, sometimes we talk to people and they kind of give you the right answer but they're like rude and they don't have nothing to do. You know, it's like that alone. Now, look, is that alone just to say they're damned, they're going to hell? No, but you know what? I think of that and I'm just thinking like, I don't think that person is saved. Does it really matter if, I if I'm wrong? No. Am I, am I going around and teaching people like this is, a, no, well, that's a workspace. Of, you know, no, it's not. But there's a spirit and there's a love and there's a love for the brethren that exists among God's people. Amen. Now, is it always exhibited and always shown? No. Is it possible for saved people to, to do wrong to one another and to even hate that person? Yes, it is. Does that make a person unsaved if they hate someone else in church? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. But thank God there is this thing called the Holy Spirit that he's given us and he has made us brethren 
And we can have a feeling of assurance just in general when we love the brethren. Is anyone unclear about what I'm, what I'm teaching tonight? So far, so far so good. All right, excellent. And like I said, if you, if you think that there's, I'm way off on that, you know, fine, but I, just make it known I'm not teaching that, you, you know, this is some backing in of the works. I'm trying to be as, as pure as possible with God's word. And when I see verses in there that, you know, I don't feel like I don't understand this verse. I think it's pretty clear. I, I don't see another way to, to think about or interpret it, but I also don't have a problem with it. It's not a problem to me that it says that um, we know that we pass from death unto life because we love the brethren. I don't have a problem with that. Let's keep going. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 11. I want to bring up some other examples of ways that people knew that someone else was saved outside of their profession of, of faith because they possessed something that only a believer could possibly have. Acts chapter 11, verse number 15. The Bible says, And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them. This is when Peter was preaching to the, to the Italians, uh, to the, um, oh, what's his name? The centurion. That was real devout, and he, and he, and he you know, uh, was, had a good report of being like this really good guy, right? He goes and preaches to them. Verse number 15, And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord that he said, how, he, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. How did he know that they got saved? Because they started speaking with other tongues which was a specific gift of the Holy Ghost. That was an evidence of their salvation. Yes, it was. Now, are there people out there that try to fake that? Yeah, they're called Pentecostals. Does that make them saved? No. Are they confused? You better believe they are. And you know what I'm going to say to a Pentecostal? Don't trust in your, in your you know, ability to babble in, in what you think is another tongue, but whether or not you believe the things that God said about his son and you're not making him a liar because you don't think it's eternal life. Again, for clarity, that's, that's what you do with those people. But was there a way to know when they saw the Holy Ghost fall upon some Italians? Did they know that they were saved? Yes, they did. Because an unsaved person did not receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. An unsaved person cannot. An unsaved person does not get the gift of the Holy Ghost. So there are certain things that believers have that saved people can get. Now, does every person, did every person that ever got saved after Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, did they all get baptized with the Holy Ghost and have the ability to speak with other tongues? No. I'm one. I've never had... The, the Holy Ghost upon me to be able to speak in a language that I don't know. It's never happened one time. Does that mean I'm not saved? No. But if I were to do that, wouldn't that be a pretty good indication that I probably am? Now again, the way that you know 100% for sure, well, there is no way to know 100% for sure. The best you can do is ask somebody, but do you still know 100% for sure? No, because they could lie to you. Can you feel love from the brethren and, and think that, yeah, they're probably saved, but they feel love? Yeah, you can. Does that mean they're absolutely saved? No, it doesn't. Can you see someone speaking with another tongue and say, wow, they must have the gift of the Holy Ghost. They must have been baptized with the Holy Ghost to be able to do that and to exhibit such power from the Holy Ghost does that probably mean they're saved? Yeah, that probably does mean they're saved. Does it mean absolutely without a doubt they're 100% they're saved? No. 
because there could be some kind of fraud. There could be some kind of fakery going on. Do you see where I'm going with this? So there are things that we could reasonably look to as they did in the book of Acts to see this person's probably saved or they are saved and it's reasonable to believe that. You say, oh, but that's their works. I mean, if you say, I mean, they're speaking with another tongue, that's a work. So how can you say that? That's, you, know, you must believe in works-based salvation because you're looking at someone who's doing some works and that's what makes them saved. No, look, no. It doesn't change the truth, though, to say that this person's saved because they, they're able to have, that they're doing, performing this miracle by some works that they're doing doesn't mean it's a works-based salvation. It just means that, hey, unbelievers don't have that. Not everyone believer has that, so you can't go there. And this is where people have logical fails. They take something that works in one direction and they think, oh, well, then that means, you know, the opposite is true. No, it doesn't. It doesn't always mean the opposite is true. Just because a believer has an ability to, say, speak with another tongue doesn't mean that if a person doesn't have the ability to speak with another tongue, it doesn't mean that they're not saved. It doesn't mean they're not a believer. Right? You can't go both ways, you know, taking the, the, the logic both ways with that. It's one directional. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Second Corinthians chapter 13, the, 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 the churches at Corinth were having an, having an issue with the Apostle Paul. And if you read First and Second Corinthians, he's really laying down the law on a lot of things. I mean, they, they had a lot of things they were screwed up on. And they also had some people in there that were causing a lot of trouble and people that needed to, to receive church discipline. And there, there was people just kind of causing problems. And they were saying, oh, yeah, Paul, he's real powerful and weighty in his letters, basically saying that, like, yeah, he, he talks a big talk, but wait till he comes here. He's going to be like nothing, right? This is the attitude they were having. Like, they're totally disrespecting Paul as if he wasn't going to come with the same power and authority in person that he had when he wrote his epistles. 2 Corinthians 13, verse number 1, the Bible says, because it, well, let's just read this. This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. He was having problems with it. He said, look, we're going to have to get some witnesses together and just establish everything that's going on. Verse 2, I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time and being absent now, I write to them which heretofore have sinned and to all other that if I come again, I will not spare you say, I'm not going to be a nice, Mr. Nice Guy this time. I'm not going to hold back. If I come again, I'm not going to hold back. I will not spare. Verse 3, since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me. They were doubting whether the things he was saying were even of God. Right? You say, well, you want, you want evidence. You want proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. And look what he says in verse number five. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? So how is he answering the fact that they're trying to seek some, well, I want to seek some proof of Christ speaking in you. He answers that with, well, hey, you better examine yourself, buddy. Are you even saved? If you're questioning what, you, what they're hearing when he is giving them the word of God and they're not receiving the word of God or not understanding it and they're saying, is this even God's word? He's saying, are you even saved? Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. And he says, don't you know, you'll prove your own selves. Why don't you figure out if you're saved, know ye not yourselves how that Jesus Christ is in you except you be reprobates. He's basically saying, unless, unless you're just these traitors like Judas, these reprobates that you go to church, you talk the talk and everything else, but inside you're full of wickedness and dead men's bones and you're just a reprobate, you're rejected. He's saying, if you're not a reprobate, then Jesus Christ is in you. If you're, you know, like you're born again. 
He says, but I trust that you shall know that we are not reprobates. Now I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that you should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. So he's saying, I hope you guys know we're not reprobates. You know, we're treating good. And, and again, this is going to go back to the concept of a good tree brings forth good fruit. The church is at Corinth. We're there because of the work that the Apostle Paul did. So basically, it's like, well, if you think I'm a reprobate, then what are you? Because I'm not going to be bringing forth good fruit if I'm a bad tree, right? So examine yourself. Are you saved? Because they're the result of his work and his effort, and they're his fruit. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 10. Because this, this also lines up, this teaching that Jesus gave in John 10 also applies. In 2 Corinthians 13, they wanted proof that Christ was speaking of, in Paul. And he told them to examine their own salvation. Not just because of the, you know, the tree and the fruit. That makes perfect sense. It matches up with Scripture. But in John chapter 10, we're going to start reading in verse number 2. Jesus said, But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. There's a concept being taught. You know, this is a parable about sheep and a shepherd, right? And there's a truth being taught here about how sheep work. Sheep know the voice of their shepherd, and if something, like, if you've got, and, and I know this is kind of weird because we don't really, you know, very few people understand the way this works anymore because of the way everything's been industrialized. But if you had a shepherd out on a hill, right, with their sheep, and he was caring for them and watching over them day and night, the sheep are going to respond to his voice. And sheep are very easy to control in that manner. They just kind of steer them one way or the other and, and, and be able to hurt them relatively easily, especially with their voice. And, um, but if they don't know you, they won't listen to you. They'll run away from you. They won't, have, they won't follow you. They won't have anything to do with you. But they will follow the shepherd. So that, that fact of life that exists in the animal of a sheep, Jesus is applying that spiritually to if you're a child of God, you're a sheep. In this context, one of Jesus' sheep, he's the shepherd, and he's saying, if you're saved, you're going to hear my voice. You're going to know the voice of the shepherd. And a stranger, you're not going to know. So people who, you know, came to church, got into an independent fundamental Baptist church that teaches right on salvation and everything else, and then you find out one of those people goes and like, you know what, no, I think Catholicism is right. And they just go, just completely, just completely reject everything. They were never a sheep. They're not going to follow the voice of a stranger. They're not going to get wrapped up in some other thing. They were never saved to begin with. Oh, well, that's a works-based salvation then because, you, you know, it's like, no. There's concepts about being saved that there, it's just truth. This is what happens. Jesus said these things, and that's why Paul's saying, you know what, examine your own salvation. You want to know evidence of Christ speaking in me. Well, can you hear the voice of Christ? Can you hear the voice of the shepherd through the words that are coming out? That's why when you compare Scripture, the Bible, with any of these other forgeries or, or these books that people want to say, oh, this should be in the Bible, that should be in the Bible. And you look at the Apocrypha and you look at you know, the book of Jasher and you look at the, these, these other books, the book of Enoch. They are so inferior to God's word, it's a joke. Like, you really think that that should be scripture? It's not scripture. It's not God's word. Why? Because it, it's when you have the spirit and when you're a sheep, you can hear the voice of the shepherd and know. Now, again, is that just, is it, does that just mean that there's never going to be anyone that's ever deceived by anything or get caught up into something wrong? And no, it doesn't. 
Does that mean automatically, absolutely, there's no way that person is saved? No. But this is a very good general rule to follow, and this is something that is true, and it's truthful, okay? There may be some other circumstances why someone gets caught up in something, and they're just kind of dumb, or they're very, you're an infant, and they're tossed to and fro with every, uh, every wind of doctrine. Okay, that happens. But at the end of the day, this still holds true. And to jump down to verse number 25, the uh, Bible says, Jesus answered them, I told you and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not because ye are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice. So he repeats himself. The people, they didn't believe Jesus. He says, because you, you're not my sheep. You're not believing what I'm saying. Even though he did all these works, he said, you know, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me, but you're still not believing because you're not my sheep. You're not hearing my voice. But my sheep do hear my voice and they do follow me. He says, I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And then someone's going to take this and say, oh yeah, see, so if someone's not following Jesus, does that mean that they're not saved? No. Well, he said there, my sheep follow me. It's an illustration. The following there is talking about hearing the voice and following the voice. It's not, it's not walking in the path and, and, and doing every single work and repenting of all your sins and all this other stuff. You can't take that and extrap extrapolate that too far out of context. It's just he's talking about hearing his voice and understanding that. So, um, but that's also something that, as a sheep, as a believer, is true. It's another element to provide you assurance of your salvation. Is it the primary one? Is it the one I'm going to always go to? No. If someone's doubting their salvation, am I going to say, oh, you know, like, sheep hear my voice? Okay, no. But is it a fact? Yes, it is a fact. That's why even in 1 John, applying that to what this, this concept in John chapter 10, you have to turn if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 John 4, 5 says, They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. How do we know that? Well, because we're saved. How do we know that? Because he that knoweth God heareth us. That's what John was saying. If you know God, you're going to hear us. Just like Jesus said, you know, if you believed Moses, you'd believe me. If you listen to Moses, if you actually receive what Moses was saying, you would receive me. If you are a true believer, it doesn't matter which prophet is speaking, you would hear the word of God and receive it. This is another test that I think is a good test to use with certain people. Do they have any understanding of Scripture? Or does everything seem to go over their heads? When someone tells me, I just don't understand the King James Bible at all. I've read it. I've read it cover to cover, and I just don't understand it. You know what my concern is? That they're not saved. Now, if someone says that, if someone's having a hard time, does that just automatically mean they're not saved? No, it doesn't. Okay, so again, don't draw these hard lines where I'm not drawing this hard line, just, okay, now... You're, so you're saying you have to hear the voice of the shepherd. You have to understand all the Bible. You, have, you know, it's like, I'm not saying that. But there are truths that are found that we could hear the voice of the shepherd, that we do hear the voice of the shepherd. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It's explained even further. Verse number 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Look at verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God. 
for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. Is it possible for an unregenerate, unsaved, natural man to receive and know the things of the Spirit of God? Is it possible according to 1 Corinthians 2.14? No. Why? Because they're spiritually discerned and their spirit is dead. They don't have a live spirit to help them understand. All they know is the natural man. They cannot understand. They cannot receive the things. You can get a certain level of a head knowledge of certain doctrines taught to you when you're not saved, but are you really going to understand the Bible? No, because it's a spiritual book. There's spiritual words, and it needs to be spiritually understood. Anyone that's saved probably ought to, if you got saved at least at uh, maybe a later point in your life, Maybe not so much if you were really young when you got saved. You might not know the distinction. I know the distinction. When I tried to read the Bible before I was saved, I, had, I could not make heads or tails of God's word at all. It made no sense to me. Now, did I know that Jesus Christ lived on the earth and performed miracles and was crucified on the cross and died and was buried? and rose? You know what? I, I, I knew those things. I understood those facts. But could I just read the Bible and understand it? No. I was like the Ethiopian eunuch in, in Acts chapter 8 saying, you know, I don't understand what this is saying. Or is he talking about himself? He's talking about some other man. I don't know what this is talking about. Can you just show me what this means? He was unsaved. He didn't know what it meant. But after you got the Spirit of God, guess what? All kinds of light bulbs go off. Now, does that mean you understand absolutely everything about the Word of God? No. But there is a big difference between what you can understand and what you can't. And I'll go as far as to say this. If someone, does it, if someone could point at Scripture and just be like, I don't believe that. I don't believe they're saved. But catch what I'm saying there. Because I'm not saying you have to believe every doctrine that I believe or else you're not saved. But there is an acceptance of God's Word. There is a trust or a belief on the Word of God that it is of God, that it is from God, and that it is true. Jesus is the Word of God. Jesus is the Word made flesh. You have to receive Jesus to be saved. You have to receive the Word of God. But if someone points to Scripture, and we've seen this before at Soul Winning multiple times, where you, just, you don't even expound on a verse. You just read a verse. You just read what the Bible says, and I've heard people say, yeah, I don't believe that. Guess what? You're not saved. Oh, you believe in a works-based salvation? No. No. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. One of the things that I like to do is, is you know, if there's people, maybe there's people that's close to me, or, you know, someone that I'm in communication with regularly, where I've given them the gospel, and, they've, and, and sometimes people get to the point to where they can say the right answers. But something in their heart they don't quite understand about salvation, right? And, and for whatever reason, they, they, they haven't, maybe it hasn't quite clicked with them, but they can tell you the right answer. So the way that you ask the questions need to change. And one of the ways that helps me to try to determine, well, did, I mean, they're giving the right answers. Are they really saved? But you still have this doubt. And, and you, know, you can't even always put your finger on it. Like, why do I have this doubt about their salvation? I mean, they're saying the right thing, but it just doesn't, see, it doesn't seem right. If you can just start asking a bunch of questions, just like, well, what about this and what about this? And actually like going through scripture and they just, ha they just don't get it and don't understand it. And they just have all these weird beliefs and stuff. And you're saying is, you know, like it's a good indicator that person's not saved. It's a good indicator. Now, again, what do we ultimately have to go off of? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. We ultimately just have to go on what they say. I mean, but again, when you're looking at someone else, does it really make that much of a difference in the end? It's not going to impact you if you're right or wrong about their salvation. And if you're looking at yourself, you still have to look at what you believe. You know what's in your heart. You know what you believe. But we have all these other things that go along with salvation that help us along the way. And there are certain things that only, only believers have. Now, they may not always exhibit it, 
which is why you can't just use all these things to say that that person's not saved because we still have a flesh. Yes, we have the Spirit, and the Spirit brings all kinds of things with it. There is the fruit of the Spirit, for example, in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. Don't turn there. Galatians chapter 5 gives us... Return, if you would, to Romans chapter 8. Rom, Galatians 5 gives you the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no, no law. If you have the Spirit of God in you, and you walk in that spirit, that is the fruit of that spirit. But if you're not walking in that spirit, you're not going to see the fruit of that spirit. And because we have the choice to walk in the flesh or walk in the spirit, you can't just say, well, if someone doesn't have this fruit, then they're not saved. Because that just means they're walking in the flesh. But I'll tell you what, if you're walking in the Spirit and you have all these things, that can give you a level of assurance of your own salvation. I have peace. I have joy. I don't think it's some wicked thing to just say that about yourself, about knowing you know, you're not just saying, oh, you're not saved because you don't have peace or joy. You're saying, I have this stuff. And I know that this is the fruit of the Spirit, so that helps give me more assurance, even more assurance of my own salvation. I don't have a problem with that. And I don't have a problem with anyone teaching that either. Now, but, I mean, obviously you have to be very clear. You ought to be very careful just to be clear because you can see how that can lead into very dangerous territories of, of people getting mixed up and getting bad ideas and, and then starting to make, the, you know, to turn it into like this workspace salvation. I can see that. Look, I'm not stupid. I get it. The clarity is extremely important. But I am all for accepting what the Scripture says for what the Scripture says and applying it appropriately. The biggest problem is when you have these works-based salvation teachers abusing passages that talk about discipleship and misapplying that to salvation. And that's where all the confusion comes from. And we definitely need to vehemently rebuke that heresy and not stand for it, not allow it. But as I mentioned before, you know, sometimes in that zeal, some people get on a hair trigger to condemn anything that they think sounds even close to, to anything teaching what those guys teach. And as much as I am against, you know, the Paul Washers and the MacArthur's and stuff, Don't let your zeal against a heretic blind yourself to a particular truth in God's word. Like the truths that we're looking at tonight. There's nothing wrong with these things. They're not contradictions. They're good things. Take the whole of what's being taught, especially before labeling someone a heretic or accusing them of being, you're just like Paul Washer. You're just like John MacArthur. As I, I had someone commenting about that with me on a YouTube video for Love the Brethren. Because of the one statement I was making about one verse in 1 John chapter 3, the one that I talked about again tonight, verse 14. It's like, you're going to get all over someone's case who's been preaching right, who preaches right, who doesn't teach anything even close to that and start associating, you know, that, that's ridiculous. You're in Romans chapter 8. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So again, Romans 8 is a passage similar to 1 John chapter 3 and chapter 4 and chapter 5 that draws a distinction between walking in the Spirit and walking in the flesh. And then, but then it also talks about having the Spirit. Right? If you have the Spirit, you have eternal life. If you're walking in the Spirit, you're going to be exhibiting the works of walking in the Spirit. Right? They're two different things. Having the Spirit means you're saved. Walking in the Spirit means you're doing the works. Okay? Not walking in the Spirit doesn't make a person unsaved. It just means you're walking in the flesh. So, so Romans 8, we're going we're to read through this a little bit, but, but pay attention. And that's why I, you know, I'm going to read a lot of context here because it's important. Let's get all of the context before I get to the part where I, I want to 
emphasize. Verse number one, there is therefore now no condemnation of them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law, excuse me, what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And you know what? That's a good say. I didn't even have that one highlighted in my, in my verse to, to, to expound upon. But there are certain things that are just absolute truth. So if someone's in the flesh, can they please God? No. And guess what? Someone who is not saved is, is always in the flesh. So can they ever please God? According to this verse, no. Does that mean they can't ever do a good thing? No. But when, they, when they're in the flesh, are they, do they please God? No. And if they don't have the spirit to be walking in, then how can they ever please God? So you see, I mean, these verses stand alone. And, and just because you have someone, oh, but this person does this good and this good, that's got to be pleasing to God. Well, I'm going to stand on what the Word of God says, what the Scripture says, and not my own understanding. Verse number nine, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. So now he's going to explain, what does it mean to be in the flesh or to be in the Spirit? If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Now this, earlier in the chapter, is talking about walking in the Spirit, right? Or walking in the, in the flesh. Now, now he's making a distinction here and making a definition of you are not in the flesh but in the spirit if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. If you're saved, the spirit of God dwells in you. Okay? So he's saying, now, for, for this context and in this purpose, he's saying, if you have the spirit of God in you, then you're not in the flesh. There's other places where it would say that you are in the flesh if you're doing the deeds of the flesh, right? But for this purpose and in this context, he's saying, well, as long as you're saved, as long as you have the Spirit of God, then you're not in the flesh for what he's talking about. So we got to, you know, again, read and be very careful with what we're looking at here. What is he trying to say? What point is he trying to make? What truth is trying to be given to us? And how are the words being used? Because the same words can be used differently based on context. In this particular portion, being in the Spirit means that you're saved, means that you have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. And again, hey, that's a great passage of your eternal security. Because you still have this wicked, sinful flesh, but you know what? If that Spirit of God's in you, then at the resurrection, guess what? That Spirit of God's going to quicken you. That Spirit of God is going to, uh, that dwells in you shall quicken your mortal bodies, which means make your body back to life. It's going to give you that change at the resurrection. Verse number 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may all be also glorified together. Now, talking about being a son of God or being children, verse 17 clarifies this is talking about salvation because being a child means then you're heirs and you're heirs of God and you have an inheritance and it means you're saved, right? And verse number 14 says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God. So if you're led by the Spirit of God, does that prove that you're saved? 
Yes, it does. Because that means that you are a son of God. Is every son of God allowing the Spirit to lead them? No, but is everyone that's led by the Spirit of God a child of God? Yes, they are. And then it also tells in verse 16, the Spirit bears witness. Is that true? Does anyone believe that that's true? The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So can we reasonably say that I can gain some level of assurance of my salvation if I have the Holy Spirit bearing witness with my own spirit that I'm saved? Yes. Yes, that's, you know what? That is another way to know, have assurance of my salvation. Now, can some people maybe not understand? Some people are unsaved, think they have the Spirit of God and trust in that for their assurance of salvation and be wrong? Sure they can. But does that mean that I should not teach or preach that the Spirit bears witness with my spirit that I'm saved, that I'm a child of God? No. I'm going to be careful and be very clarifying like I did at the very beginning of the sermon saying this is what you really need to, to just completely rely on because there is no gray area there. There is no feeling. There is no what's the spirit. It's very clear cut and dry. But at the same time, we have lots of other evidences and lots of other proofs and lots of other assurances that will help us and that we can look to and be like, yeah, I've got this and this and this and this and this. Most importantly, my belief but everything else here that the Bible's saying that a child of God has is there. And I could draw assurance from that. 1 John 3, 24, you don't have to turn it, turn it to Hebrews chapter 12. We're almost done. This is actually the last point I'm going to make in Hebrews 12. We're almost done. 1 John 3, 24 says, And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Matches up perfectly with Romans 8. His spirit bears witness with our spirit. We know we're children of God because of that. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 6. The Bible says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Does God discipline or scourge every son whom he receives? Yes, he does. Hebrews 12, 6 says that. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Now, Again, the context and the purpose of this is to provide comfort because when you're getting disciplined by God, hey, at least know that it's because God loves you. And then he says in verse 8, eight but if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. The purpose of this is to help us understand, hey, when you get chastened by God, it's okay. Don't, don't get upset or worry about it too much because that just means God loves you. Get right with God, Right? But, but at least you're not a bastard. Now, it also is teaching here that if someone's not receiving discipline by God, then they are a bastard, right? Because every son gets disciplined. But is this really a good indicator to look at somebody else and say, well, that person never gets disciplined by God, so they must not be saved? Now, if it were true that they weren't getting disciplined, then yes, they wouldn't be saved. But here's the only problem with that is that we can't always tell what discipline somebody's getting. We don't always know what's going on in their life. We can't, you know, so you can't see those things. It's best to make this application to yourself. You know what's going on in your life. You know any level of conviction that you feel. You know how you might be being afflicted in ways that nobody else knows. Now, it's still a true statement. If there's someone out there that's not being chastened by the Lord, they're not his son. That's never been chastened. I'm not saying like continually being chastened, but you know, they've never been chastened. Everything's always gone well for them or whatever. Never been punished, never been disciplined by God. That person's not saved. But we can't always tell who that is, which is why we don't use scripture like this to just say that that's, you know, that's the case. Let's see if there's anything else I'm missing. Because that, 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 there's so many little things like that in the Bible that we see characteristics of having the Spirit or being born again, being a child of God, that are absolutely true. And we don't have to shy away from those things. And, not, and I'm not going to not teach them just because I'm worried about someone 
you know, saying, oh, you're teaching the same thing as Paul Washer. No, I'm not. Not even close. Not even in the same ballpark. But these things are true. A saved person hears the voice of the shepherd. They have the spirit of God that bears witness with their spirit. They can understand spiritual things. And notice I said can. Not that they always do. They can. They have the ability to. They can have a gift of the Spirit. Doesn't mean they always do. They endure chastening. They do. They will. If they haven't yet, they will. There will be chastening from the Lord. They can love the brethren the way that the Bible talks about loving the brethren. Doesn't mean they always will, but they can. They have the ability to. They will never blaspheme the Holy Ghost. So anyone that blasphemes the Holy Ghost never has forgiveness. And if you're already saved, you already have eternal life. They will never take the mark of the beast because everyone that takes the mark of the beast goes to hell. And they will never change God's word. These are attributes of a, of a born-again saved person. We do need to be careful how we view or interpret attributes in a person but if there are all these different things that only believers can have or whatever, then, then we can apply them. I'll tell you this. I don't believe that anyone who's a sodomite is saved because that's evidence of their already being rejected, being reprobate. It's, and, and you know what? People want to say, oh, that's a works-based salvation because you think that God can't forgive. You know, it's like, No. No, it's what I'm seeing is evidence. That's what I'm seeing. So, if an unsaved person cannot have the Holy Ghost dwelling inside of them, then an indicator of someone being saved apart from their testimony is an exhibition of the Holy Ghost that resides within them. And, you know, we saw the biblical examples of the Italians speaking with other, other tongues and things like that. It's a subject that we ought to be careful about. You know, obviously dealing with salvation, we don't want to be confusing and, and leading people on the wrong path. But you know what? That's why I'm preaching this, this, this doctrine or this teaching in church tonight around people who are already saved and are believers. I don't go and teach all of this stuff to the unbeliever at the door or to try to provide somebody with some false sense of assurance of their salvation. But you know what? God has given us his spirit. God has given us a lot of great things that do offer us assurance, that do comfort our hearts, that do edify us, and, and praise God for that. Praise God for the, the fruit of the Spirit and that peace and the joy and the long-suffering, the things that we can enjoy. And when, and when you are enjoying those things, what a blessing that is and, and giving yourself your own just self-assurance. Even if you didn't need the assurance, it's still just there. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for... Um, making a new creature within us, dear Lord, giving us that new man, that new spirit that wants to do what's right. I thank you for that, dear Lord. I love that. I pray that you please help us all to walk in that new man uh, ever increasingly and that we would mortify the deeds of the flesh and that we would just, just break down and beat down the, the flesh and, uh, and weaken our flesh and strengthen our spirit that we could continue to just to do more to serve you and to be pleasing in your sight, dear God. I pray that you would please help us all to be very, very clear when it comes to what it takes for a person to be saved and not to add any confusion to the matter, dear Lord. But, uh, but we thank you for giving us a spirit. I thank you that your spirit bears witness with my spirit, especially in times where I might feel like I need a little extra assurance in the things that I'm doing, dear Lord, because there's so many things that could happen or trials or tribulations that we may go through. Lord, uh, I thank you for those things. Pray that you please help us all to, to be clear in our presentation of the gospel and getting people saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.